Good morning. If you would please bear with me as my <laughs> kind of getting over a sore throat and so uh, doing the best I can uh, filling in. But we will be looking in uh, Scripture at First Peter in chapter 5, verse 7 through 11. First Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us, into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In Southern California, police had carried out a very interesting uh, sting operation. And what had happened is that they had a list of thousands of criminals that they wanted and that had somehow escaped uh, going to jail. Instead of risking their lives by going uh, and trying to find one, um, each one, they sent every criminal a letter saying that they had won a large amount of money and that they actually had won a prize. And so the police put signs and banners outside of a building to make it look very festive and even a, a large clown to, to help bring more welcoming, to help it seem more welcoming. Now, as each criminal entered the building, they heard music and everyone started celebrating. And as uh, each one was ushered into another room, they, sh- they smiled, shook hands with the, with the man, walked into the other room, and as a person told them, they said, congratulations, you have just won yourself time in prison and to their disbelief their smile turned to a, a, a to an expression of, of of unbelief and so dozens of criminals were actually walked out the back handcuffed and sent to prison what's interesting about that story though is that the response is actually from the criminals and that despite the suspicion that they had about the letter that they received they still went anyway. You see, it was their greed that could not keep them away uh, from the suspicion of this, of this prize. I remember before I became a Christian, what my life was like before then. I got a high out of being rebellious. I remember that amazing sensation I got when I would shoplift or when I would steal a, a magazine from a store. It, it, see, I was enjoying life. And the Bible says that bread eaten in secret tastes pleasant concerning the criminal. Many think that the gospel was meant for those who were broken hearted. Uh, It's wrong to say from a biblical standpoint though that you can't live happily without Jesus. See there are many people today that actually live very happy lives without Christ. And Jeremiah 12 1 says why are they so happy that deal treacherously? But for those who have, of us who have given our lives to Christ, no longer do we go downstream with the other dead fish. God has given us life that we find ourselves not now swimming against the current. Today we'll look at some of these enemies that we have facing as, as Christians that we face on a regular basis. And we'll see who they are, what they are, and how to overcome these enemies. I love what General Douglas MacArthur said. He said, the enemy is in front of us. The enemy is behind us. <clears throat> the enemy is to the right and to the left of us. They can't get away this time. And so should the attitude that the Christian has towards the enemy, that they cannot get away this time because of the power of Christ that dwells within us. And so the first enemy we'll look at is the world. Now, as believers in Christ, we are in the world, but not part of it. 
we are taught from Scripture to be amidst a, a crooked and perverse generation, not to shy away from it. We can be friends with sinners, but not involve ourselves any further with their practices that may be contrary to God's word. This is an issue some Christians have is that they believe they can't be friends with anyone who isn't a Christian. Uh, Jesus is obviously the first example in, in Scripture of being friends of sinners, that we need to be that light in a dark place. How else does a person hear the gospel if we, nobody converses it to them? The difference is our behavior among them. There is one thing the world has that trap men and women. We need to realize that, the, that lust is the life's blood of the world. See, lust blinds a man to reason, leading him to give, as Scripture says, half his kingdom. Lust is so powerful it can drive a man to leave his wife, his children, his reputation, and run off with another woman. We are told in Scripture that Herod himself feared John the Baptist because John was a holy and just man. And Herod even protected him and heard John. It says that he heard him gladly. Yet because of Herod's sinful eye, he indulged in his, in his own self and actually had John murdered. See, Herod feared man more than he feared God. See, when we examine lust further, we see from Scripture that what lust wants is basically as what Herod wanted, your head on a plate. James 1.15 says, Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. See, this world holds firmly onto the stick of dynamite that is called sin, and they are fascinated with that flickering flame. See, lust delights the human heart, but its terrible consequences are sin, death, and eternity in hell. I've come to the conclusion as a Christian over the years that being a, a Christian and having a major struggle in my life with sin, I can tell you this, that sin has not stopped being pleasurable. It will always be pleasurable. Charles Spurgeon said this, Temptation, instead of getting weaker with our age, gets stronger. The passions which we, though, would expire when the heat of youth have evaporated, become more fierce. See, some might argue against uh, Spurgeon and say, no, doesn't the Bible say that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? It Shouldn't it get easier then? Someone once said that uh, women are like conventional ovens, while men are more like microwaves. And in meaning that for men, the heat is a daily struggle. This is a daily battle. And the reason for this isn't because of the eyes. Jesus, yes, it says that Jesus uh, said that if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is better for you to enter hell with both your eyes than with your whole. Now, Jesus wasn't saying to grab a spoon and, and scoop out you know, the gelatin in your head. Basically, what he was saying was the problem is within the heart. So your eyes are merely windows to your soul which allow you to see uh, that, allow, that you allow light and darkness in through them. And I'll explain what I mean. A pastor interviewed a man who was actually bl uh, blind from birth. When he asked him if he had ever lusted after another woman, the blind man said yes. Now, how is it that a blind man can lust after another woman if he has never uh, had the pleasure of even looking at a woman? See, despite his eyes never having the pleasure of never seeing a woman, he said it was the imagination of his mind that took, him, that took place. And this is what caused him to lust. See, this is the very reason that God actually sent a flood in Genesis 6-5. It says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thoughts, of the thoughts of his heart, was only evil continually. See, if we cannot hate sin for what it is, then hate sin for what it does. We will reap the consequences of uh, if we let sin reign in our lives. I'm afraid we can't avoid temptation of tr or trials, but God allows, does allow uh, a way out of those things. Now, Jesus did something contrary to what we do in modern Christianity in that he actually sent his sheep among wolves. 
Some of us think that when a person becomes a Christian, uh, we must protect him from the world. We say, well, keep him away from his friends. Or, uh, you know, we have to continue to prod him to go to church. See, we shouldn't have to do those things. A Christian will go through three things that the Bible says. And those three things are temptation, tribulation, and persecution. See, if you are a genuine, then these things will cause you to grow, send your roots deep into God's word. See, when we often hear of a, a major forest fire, uh, what comes to mind first is the devastation that it brings. Actually, what happens during a forest fire is that it causes trees to send their roots deeper into the soil, and even those tightly uh, shut pine cones can actually burst open and continue to spread more seed. See, we've discovered that forest fires are actually very beneficial to restore ecosystems. What also happens is that it actually gets rid of dead matter and also dying plants around in the forest. So when we go through temptation, trials, and persecutions, this is exactly what happens to us as well. The world will throw all kinds of trials and temptations at the Christian, but the Christian prospers through those things. And in, in turn, he sp- um, he sprouts up, blossoms, and, in, and spreads the seed of the gospel that others too may hear the gospel as well. The next point we'll look at is, the, is that this world is governed by Satan. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 2, Paul describes Satan as a prince with power. This power, as we see in, in Luke 4, 6, act, uh, has been given to him by God. We know that Satan has control over also some illnesses. Uh, demons are also under his command and his rule. Now, as I once before in a past sermon on the subject of Satan and demons, uh, in my own personal uh, experience with demonic spirits, uh, I also mentioned that we should uh, have put our perspective in the right place and that you're basically, uh, basically a small fry next to Satan. Uh, we have, he has very little to do with us. He is more concerned about accusing God than he is coming after you. So you're, you're like, it's basically like when a, when a cat chases a string. Uh, all he has to simply do is set something in front of you to catch you off guard and to catch, you, uh, catch your gaze off of, off of God. That's basically all he has to do is, is set those temptations in front of you and you fall. All the more we should be thankful, though, for God's Spirit that lives within us to overcome those traps that He has set before us. So this brings us to our second enemy, and we'll look at which is the Bible calls the devil, or another name for it is uh, for him is Satan. Actually, there are quite a few names for Satan in Scripture. Uh, he is referred to as the father of lies, the accuser, the god of this age, the prince of the power of the air, and, and so on. In two the, in two thousand nine, the Barna group found many individuals who actually professed being Christians and that half of those who took the survey uh, denied the existence of Satan. Most of them denied the existence of Satan. Now, on the other hand, to say you believe Satan exists, you would sound pretty ridiculous. But the Bible makes it clear that, very clear that Satan does exist. Even the dialogue between um, Satan and Jesus gives us uh, evidence that uh, be, Jesus being tempted in the desert, that there was some dialogue between the two. So it's not figurative, figurative speech, nor is he, a, as oftentimes de- depicted in movies, as a little man uh, with, with a pitchfork poking people. It's made clear from Scripture that he is a very powerful enemy. And this is why we are instructed not to go out anywhere without equipping ourselves with, uh, and God in the Bible has equipped us with certain weapons, that which we'll look at in a moment. So resisting the devil is accompanied by submitting to God. When we occupy our lives with the things of God, what room do we give for Satan in our lives? So, see, Satan tempts us to bring the worst in us, bring out the worst in us, but God tests us to bring out the best. Another important point to make is that we have the ability to resist Satan, not rebuke. The ability to resist Satan and not rebuke. Now, in my 
my own experiences, I've never rebuked or cast out demons uh, when dealing with them, but when their manifestation was, was made known in my home, I didn't address them or ask for their names or uh, do any kind of, kind of other rituals, but basically what I did was I went to my knees and went to the Lord in prayer. And in doing so, I drew closer to God in those moments. We make a way uh, for de- demonic influence in our lives when we give way to sin in our lives. So the way we win the battle is to be in our knees and in prayer. No other army in the world fights a battle on their knees and wins that battle. See, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. See, that word may is actually a word of permission that is given to Satan. So he is given that power to go about. So when we sin, we give ourselves to Satan and we actually are in his territory. The next point we'll look at is that we are to labor for wisdom. And one way we can be sure to resist Satan is that we are continuing to seek wisdom and use tactics we learn from Scripture to save us some pain of falling into Satan's schemes. Scripture gives us this great tactic to use against the enemy. Uh, We are to be fully clothed with the armor of God. Philip Brooks said, Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks commensurate with your strength. Pray for strength commensurate with your tasks. In other words, he is, we are instructed to put on the armor of God. This, is, this should be evidence that God places us in a battlefield and we are to go fully equipped. How often do we pray to God that he would take away the pain or remove the cancer from somebody? or to make their lives easier that they may go through this, trip, uh, this trial? Do you not pray that God would give them strength to endure? Or are you not thankful that God has allowed for this trial to happen, that he may work, do his work in their life or in your life? Or do you demand that, you move, that he move in your direction in the ways that you would want? Ephesians 6.12 indicates that the conflict we have with Satan is a spiritual battle and no tangible weapon can be effectively used against him or his demons. What we are not given is a specific list uh, or a tactic that Satan will use against us. But we are told that, we can't, that, we, that when we follow those instructions faithfully, then we are able to stand. See, the armor of God is a crucial thing We are to put it on that we may withstand the fiery darts of the wicked. The last enemy we'll look at is the flesh. Now, too many of us give Satan way too much credit when we sin. Uh, We think that every time we sin, it's got to be his fault or it's got to be somebody else's fault. Uh, I think this comes as a result of our pride. Uh, We are too prideful to admit that we make mistakes. We don't want to be embarrassed or perhaps even uh, ashamed of those things that we commit. Yes, as Christians, we do sin. But the difference for us is that although a person who lives without Christ dives into sin, as a Christian, you sin against your will. This is the difference. The sinner dives into sin while the Christian falls into sin. So you resist temptation rather than embrace it. Do you not feel the conflict when you are faced with temptation, but know that you are no longer slaves to sin as Romans chapter 6 verse, uh, chapter six, verse 6 says. See, we can... See an example of how the working of the flesh is evident in the world. According to a recent survey taken in the U.S., over $3,000 is spent on pornography actually each second, and even as we speak, even as I speak. And every 39 minutes, a new pornographic video is actually being made in the U.S. Such statistics underscore the statement that Jeremiah made. 
when he mourned and said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? The Bible makes it clear that living in the flesh produces a number of unfortunate consequences. It's like a man who stands at the top of a building and says, I bet you that I can fly if I jump off of this building. And as he jumps and passes by each window, he says, see, I'm flying. As a result, he's going to suffer the consequences for his actions. See, we have to realize that sin begins in the heart. Just as we looked at before, recognize that sin uh, starts there and we can't blame it on Satan. We can't blame it on others, <clears throat> our spouse or our children. We are responsible for our own actions. Now, we may have great arguments about how things are, uh, um, things like porn um, pornography is bad for society, things like uh, how we can affect marriage and relationships. But you have more chance of convincing a pig that the mud in which he wallows is bad for him. See, the pig doesn't stomp around in mud basically because he's a filthy creature. The, the pig wallows in the mud because he is trying to cool his flesh. And the only way to stop a pig from wallowing in the mud is simply to do this, is to kill it. That's what the law of God does. It nails a sin-loving sinner to the cross and reveals to him he is dead because of his trespasses. Sin is not wrong because it's harmful to society, but because God says it's wrong. And our next point that we'll look at is that it is a fear of the Lord that causes us to depart from sin. Luke chapter 12, uh, 12, verse 5 says, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to, to you, fear him. When I go out and as we will go out this evening, uh, I always share why a person goes to hell rather than just saying he is going to hell. Uh, people will often accuse Christians of being judgmental when they do so. Uh, when they speak of sin, but this should not shy us away from saying words, things like, like sin, hell, and judgment. The Christian makes a moral judgment. He warns the sinner that he is on his way to hell. It's like a blind man walking towards the edge of a cliff. As you tell him about the 100-foot fall, he says, no, I don't believe you. I think you're just trying to scare me. Till the blind man gets closer and closer to the edge and what you do is you pick up 10 rocks and you drop them off of the edge of the cliff and you tell him, please listen. That's how far you're going to fall if you don't stop. See, what will happen is that fear will actually grip his heart and now he is aware of his danger. You and I sh should always implement the Ten Commandments when sharing the gospel. Let the person tremble before God. Let them fear God. The Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And if you don't believe me, listen to the Prince of Preachers on the subject. Charles Spurgeon said, I do not believe that any man can preach the gospel who does not preach the law. So it is crucial that we understand this principle as this is the way a sinner comes to repentance is actually rescued from the flames of hell. Now, John Wesley, those of you who know uh, another evangelist often referred to himself as a brand plucked from the fire in, w in which he was quoting Zechariah in chapter 3, verse 2. Now, those of you who don't know, the story of when uh, John Wesley was five years old, <clears throat> John, uh, the Wesley's home actually caught fire uh, one night and all of J uh, John's siblings were removed <laughs> safely from the home until they counted all the children, and they found that little John had actually been, uh, had actually stayed behind in the in the house as it burnt. And a farmer nearby actually spotted John in the window in the upstairs, uh, upstairs in the window. And what they did was that the neighbors actually climbed on top of each other's shoulders to reach to get to John. And as they got to John, they pulled him out of the fire. And just moments 
after the, he had escaped from that, the roof of the house had collapsed and the, and the whole entire house actually burst into flames. See, we do that with the sinner and that we go to them, go to them sharing the gospel that we are pulling them from the fire and just in time. The Bible says, saving with fear, pulling them from the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, it is known that Winston Churchill failed uh, the sixth grade and he was uh, subsequently defeated in actually every election uh, for public office until he became prime minister at the age of 62 during World War II. He later wrote, never give in, never give in, never, 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 and nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never, never, never give up. His, see, his work is temporal. Yours is eternal. He never gave up the battle against Hitler in that time. And how much more should we never give up the battle against our enemy? See, the Bible says to be steadfast and unmovable as, as we are called to do. As Christians, we are given this promise that Christ has given victory over the flesh. Now, although we do sin as Christians, remember, as I said before, you are not a, a slave to sin. Sin no longer rules over you. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a promise from God that though at times it may seem impossible to get over a bad habit, God will complete that work in you so that you may overcome those things. The Bible provides a three-step uh, process on how we may do so for conquering the flesh and restoring ourselves to a right relationship with God. The first one is acknowledging our sinful nature. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, and skipping to verse 10, it says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. See, this results in a walk of honesty when a person acknowledges his sinful nature, his sinful behavior before God. This means we agree with what God is saying about us. And the next step is that we are to walk in the Spirit, which involves calling out to God for salvation and receiving His Holy Spirit that empowers a person to live rightly before God and not obey the desires of the flesh. And the last step is a walk of death where we crucify the flesh. See, what happens is the flesh is starved of its appetite and as a result, it results in its death. Even though a person is born again through the Spirit of God, he must understand that he is still, uh, he still possesses the old nature and is constantly at war with the new nature. <clears throat> From a practical standpoint, the Christian purposely avoids feeding the old self and instead practices new behaviors that are driven by the, Holy, by the work of the Holy Spirit. One of the goals of the, of the Christian life <coughs> is the victory of of the spirit over the flesh, which is a righteous living for God. Now, uh, growing up, I had a, a deep fascination with the story of the Titanic, and uh, I did m- much research as a, as a child in doing so, and even still today, I do uh, I do that research. And one of those uh, one of the uh, s- studies that I found that there was a story that actually was brought up in in the story of the Titanic, and that many people are actually not aware of. It's an inspiring story of John Harper, a Baptist minister who was actually aboard the Titanic when it, and when the Titanic sank. <clears throat> he spent his, it says that he spent his final hours winning souls to Christ. And as the, the Titanic sank, he gave his life vest to another man in that time. And as he floated in the freezing water, his voice could actually be heard asking uh, those in the water uh, about them asking, have you been saved? And if somebody said no, he would actually reply back, 
and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and ye shall be saved. Now, those were the, actually the last words that were heard from him as he uh, sank out of sight and into the icy water. See, this is a man who truly lived a righteous life before God and whose life was spent in intercessory prayer for sinners in need of salvation in his final moments. <clears throat> it has been said that the sinking of the Titanic actually has very close parallels to the gospel we preach. This world itself has uh, Titanic graved on it because it prefers to steer to its own direction rather than God's direction. It was thought of the passengers that the ship couldn't possibly sink. And when passengers were aroused to come out of their sleep during the night and strap into a life vest, many of them actually thought that it was a joke. See, you and I strap into the life vest that God has given us, that is being Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Many laugh and scorn as we look ridiculous in doing so. <clears throat> Many of the things we do are absolutely ridiculous such as, uh, to the world, such as prayer. We thank God for not just the blessings in our lives, but we thank God for also the troubled things in our lives. <clears throat> we forgive our enemies. We believe what the Bible says about Adam and Eve, uh, a talking snake, Samson and his hair, Jonah and the whale. See, we suffer the scorn of a proud and wicked generation. But as just as many met their doom that night on, on the, when the Titanic sank, this world too will soon meet its final destination, which the Bible calls hell. Like the old hymn that says, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. And all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. If you are uncertain as to where you stand before God, then I ask you to examine yourself. Do you give yourself to the lusts of this world as we looked at today? The Bible says that God will one day judge this world in righteousness. Those who are liars those who steal, those who use God's name in vain, and those who look with lust. Jesus made clear that those who look with lust commit adultery of the heart. All who do so are, are in danger of hell, cut off from all blessings as you, will, as you will be stripped from your loved ones and no longer to be able to converse with anybody for eternity, where there will be much weeping and mourning and a gnashing of teeth. And as you are conscious of the lost opportunity that you had to respond to the gospel. <clears throat> See, uh, I, think it was, I think it was John Wesley that uh, it is said of him that he actually had, uh, or maybe it was John George Whitfield, but he, uh, who had actually uh, tears that would stream down his eyes as he preached because he cared so much for the lost. He said, you, you weep for yourselves. Uh, excuse me, you, you blame me for weeping, but you do not weep for yourselves, as this may be the last message that you may hear and be ever coming to, um, and before ever coming to Christ. If I uh, could encourage you, if you do not have that fear for the lost, I would encourage you to read a book that's actually um, from Bill Wise, Bill Wees, which is a, a book um, called uh, Twenty Three Minutes in Hell. Uh, I do not ask that you believe his vision or his experience that he had in hell but i ask that in doing so you would examine scripture that you would examine what the bible says about hell many of us do not uh, understand or even see that the bible actually speaks very frequently of the bible and gives very much characteristics of it uh in his book he actually mentions that some of the things that will actually be in hell <clears throat> some of the experiences is that there will actually be a loss of communication. You will never be able to communicate with another person ever again. This actually flies in the face of those who say, uh, well, if I go to hell, I'll be going to hell with my friends. Yeah, your friends will be there, but you will never be able to talk to them. See, communication is actually a blessing from God. Fellowship is a blessing from God. Those are things will actually be stripped from you. It says that also that, he said that uh, just as 
uh, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, just one drop of water on your tongue would have satisfied you. But ye are denied that very thing in hell. Also that you have a body in hell, which is very much like the body that you have here on earth, and it will burn forever. And also in his experience in, uh, there, there was, there was a loss of, there was no blood, there was no water. That's because, again, blood and water is a blessing from God. And there, death cannot take you. You will wish for death, but it will never come. And this was one of the torments that the rich man had and that he wished for death because of the place he was at, and it was torment to him. <coughs> and again, this is a place that was meant for Satan and his demons, not for man. But men go there because they deny Christ, and, and they break his commandments. <coughs> so again, I ask, if you are uncertain of where you stand before God, I would uh, ask that you examine yourself where you stand with God that you may come to a place of repentance. The Bible says that we must confess, repent, and put our faith and trust in Christ, that he may save us on the day of judgment. I uh, had a conversation with uh, a fellow Christian recently, and then some of the things that were going on in the church, and some of the things that were going on in the church were uh, the, uh, the death of a, of a son of somebody on the worship team because of a, a heroin overdose. And as well, one of the uh, church members, a former church member, actually went and had a, a sex change. See, some of those things that are creeping into the church, those who are false, as the scripture says, false prophets, false teachers, those who thought they were followers of Christ. On the day of judgment, Jesus said, many will say to him, Lord, Lord. See, that is, a, that is evidence that there is somebody that was in the church that sit amongst, that sat amongst God's people, that thought they knew God that thought they were saved. And again, it says that they were cast into hell for all eternity. <clears throat> so again, I, I pray that if that is you today, that you would again examine and see where you stand before God. Let us close up in a word of prayer. 